stories. So this happened like five years ago when I was in high school. I was like 16 years old at the time. Let me describe myself. I was about five foot three inches, long blonde hair, tan. I had a huge rack and a bubble butt. I was so cute and a lot of boys liked me, but that is what led to the events I'm about to tell you about. I was very attractive. All the guys would stare at me and some of them even hit on me. Most of the time, I found it annoying and was used to it. But sometimes I wish that they'd just leave me the fuck alone. I hated going to school and being harassed by every fucking teenage boy going through the phases of manhood. I would sometimes make myself less attractive and would even use drugs so they'd lose interest in me. It didn't really destroy my high school reputation, but it did make some of the upper middle class athletes not want to talk to me because they were health nuts and cared about their bodies and their future lives as professional athletes. But I did attract the attention of some ratty haired greasy punk that was into anime and martial arts. I was completely repulsed by the very sight of this guy and he had bad breath and looked like he was not all there. Like he was on drugs. He stumbled over to me and pointed his finger at me and says, Halt! Who art thou? I just looked at him blankly like what the fuck is wrong with this idiot he then lowers his finger and says my name is Gary and I am the sword master champion and you do not belong here prep I just rolled my eyes and told him I'm not a prep you idiot I heard you had some shit I could buy Gary looks around and checks the doors and tells me to walk forward he follows behind me and then asks very quietly where did you hear this from? I tell him that his friend Nick told me. Gary then nods his head and agrees. Gary then hands me my shit and I give him his money. Later when I got home, I was enjoying the drugs that I'd bought when suddenly I hear my phone ring and it scares the piss out of me and I nearly have a heart attack because I'm too high on drugs. I answer the phone and it's Gary. If you ever want it, don't have the money and I can arrange something for you he said um ew no I have money bro I don't need to do anything like that Gary then says to me you can get it for free if you give me that ass I hung up on Gary creeped and shivering with disgust like I had bugs crawling on me I was completely sickened by the thought of Gary wanting to touch me and being high on the drugs it made me visualize his hands covered in maggots and worms all over me and I started to feel sick and ran outside for air. The next day I found Nick and told him look your friend Gary you know that disgusting neckbeard that sells the shit he is a nasty motherfucker and I don't want to buy from him again. Nick looks down and shakes his head then tells me that he will take care of it. Nick told Gary that he wasn't allowed to deal drugs anymore because he was scaring off the customers and Gary was pissed when he heard this and threatened to chop off my head. I laughed, thinking it was a joke. Bye. And I am happy and sick and weak and strung out on my drugs. And then I get a phone call. Hello. Who the fuck is this? Is this Max? Max was my best friend. No, this is not Max, you junkie whore. It was Gary. I was terrified. My high was dead. Um, why are you calling me? I asked. I sat upright in my bed. Gary told me he was going to chop my head off. I was afraid. I did not want to call the cops and tell them that I had bought drugs from Gary. I tried calling Nick and he answered, what up? I took a few deep breaths as I calmed myself. Gary is trying to kill me, I told Nick. Nick replied, what the fuck do you want me to do about it? Then Nick hung up the phone. 
I did not know what to do. Yuri then rings my phone again. I know you are home. And I know your parents aren't here. He then sings softly, but horribly, the theme song to Sailor Moon, or some shit like that. He then stops singing and says, I am going to come in the house, and you are going to get what you deserve. Just as Gary was approaching the door, Daniel and his boys from the football team come speeding up the road and slam on the brakes. Daniel then gets out of his truck and yells loudly. Daniel and his friends were raging alcoholics. He then notices that Gary is in the bushes and him and his friends run over and start kicking the shit out of Gary. I run outside and beg Daniel to stop before he kills him. Daniel then looks at me. I am standing outside on my porch with just a t-shirt and panties underneath. Daniel sees me and he immediately comes after me. I run and try to slam the door and Daniel just barrels right through me and the door. Daniel is 6 foot 4 inches and 245 pounds. He then backhands me and starts trying to undress me. His friends are laughing and yelling nonsense and I am screaming for help. Then Daniel does it and everyone stops and stares in silence and in shock. I lay there quiet and turn the other way. Daniel then walks back to his truck and drives off. His friends don't follow. One friend leans down as if he wanted to take his turn, and another pulls his shoulder, and they all run off. Gary sits up and is crying and telling me that he is sorry. The police arrive, and they take Gary to jail. I am taken to the hospital. The police come and want to question me. I am too terrified to speak, but I have to, and I tell them it wasn't Gary. Gary tells his side of the story to the police. Gary says that he was only going to scare me and make me think that he wanted to kill me. And after he caused enough emotional trauma, he'd leave. Gary made it clear that he never had any intention of raping me. The police ask about Daniel, and I don't say anything. They ask Gary if he recalls what he remembers. Daniel was a raging drunk that loved to drive around and get into fights with people. Mostly him and his friends would drive around and start shit with Hispanics. They have been shot at and somehow made it out alive. However, the night of the assault, they were driving aimlessly and saw Gary in my yard. Stopped to check out who Gary was. No one knows why Daniel wanted to do what he did. And everyone was in utter shock when it happened. I was later released from the hospital, and Daniel was never found. I did not want to return home, so I went and stayed with my grandma. I was sitting up later, watching Halloween on television, about to doze off. My phone rings, and it is an unknown number. I stare at the phone, and my anxiety is through the roof. I don't answer. The phone rings again, and I scream, Leave me alone! And then I hear a soft voice, Hey, hey, easy funny. It's just Brittany. Thank God I thought to myself. Brittany asks how I am doing, and I tell her I'm fine. We chat for a bit, and I go to bed. The next day, I get another phone call, and it's Daniel. You need to meet me in town for dinner. I always buy the bitches I fuck at dinner. Daniel said smug and confident, and then kind of chuckled. I told him that I was calling the police. He then threatened to kill me. I called the police, and the call would not go through. The signal was being blocked. I became irritable, and I threw the phone at the wall. I peeked out my window to see if there was anything unusual, and I grabbed my purse and left. As I was driving, I get another phone call. Hey, I heard that you were an easy fuck. How about the boys and I come get us some tea? An unknown male voice says to me as he and a few others laugh. I hang up the phone and I start crying. A cop sees that I am crying and he follows me. I see his lights flashing. I pull over and he asks if everything is okay. I am nervous and an emotional wreck. I hear my phone ring and it is Daniel again. I recognize the number. So me being scared that he may be watching, I tell the officer that I am fine 
and he tells me that I shouldn't be driving in the state I am. I then tell the officer that I am in danger and that he needs to pretend to arrest me because someone may be watching. The officer explains that he can't arrest me if I haven't done anything wrong. I tell the officer that I have heroin in the car and that someone is after me. The officer gives me a look and asks if I am sure that there are drugs in the car and I tell him that I believe there is. The officer calls for backup and gets permission to search my car. The officer informs me that I will get a charge and I tell him that I don't know what else to do. I can't call the police because my phone is probably being bugged or my rapist Daniel is watching me. Backup officers arrive and they do a search and they don't find anything in my car. I was a little pissed off because I was hoping they would. Now they are going to let me go and Daniel will find me and know that the search was fake. So I punch one of the cops and I am slammed hard on the ground and taken to jail for assault and battery of a police officer. The charges are dropped when I explain my story and I tell them that I am being stalked by Daniel. They put me in a safe house and monitor me for a few weeks and search for Daniel and they can't find him. They tell me that they can no longer continue with the case and I leave the safe house. As soon as I get in my car, I get another phone call. I smash my phone and go buy another one. And about a week later, I get another phone call and it's the scumbag Daniel. But he is calling from Brittany's phone. Brittany wanted to say hello, but she can't because she is in the bathtub. Daniel laughs and then hangs up. I call the police and tell them to go check out Brittany. I then drive to my grandparents' house and go through my grandfather's old war stuff and I find his old gun, bullets. My grandma almost catches me and asks me what I am doing and I tell her I am just reminiscing about grandpa. She says okay and I sneak out with the gun. Daniel calls again and I agree to meet him. When I arrive at the meeting spot, he isn't anywhere to be found. I am confused and feel uneasy, worried he is going to sneak up on me and force himself on me again. He never shows up. I stop receiving phone calls. About two or three weeks later, I find out that Daniel was in a deadly drunk driving accident. He was drinking and speeding down the highway on his way to meet me, and he rammed into a dump truck after running a red light, and he was killed. I was relieved. Brittany survived his attack. She wasn't raped, thankfully, but he did beat her and try to drown her. She wouldn't tell him how to get a hold of me. The other guys that were with Daniel that night when he attacked me were later arrested for unrelated reasons, except for one who was arrested for taking pictures of girls in the locker room and selling them. This happened when I was around eight years old. I grew up in a small town. In that small town, there was a trailer park and I lived with my mom and father. My father was sick because he'd caught the flu or something while working and he had to take a few weeks off of work. My father was able to return to work. My father made great money. Now I know what you're thinking. If he was making great money, why were we living in the trailer park? Well, first of all, the trailer we lived in was a nice double wide four bedroom trailer in brand new condition. It wasn't a run down roach infested shit box like we have lived in before. Anyway, while my father was at work, mom started having her friend come over. Her friend looked weird and acted weird. He would sit down on the couch and when I tried to walk past him, he would grab me and hug me. He smelled awful like cigarettes, burnt clothes, and beer. Mom seemed to think it was cute, even though she could see I was uncomfortable. 
You treat our guests with respect, you little bitch, she said to me. He started coming over more and more. Then I started seeing him walking in and out of the bedroom and his boxers. I found it weird, but did not fully understand. One day after school, I walked in the front door and he was sitting on the couch watching porn and smoking crack. He sees me and tells me to come sit on the couch with him. I run to my room. He got up and I slammed the door, shut and cried. Mom gave her crackhead pedophile boyfriend a kiss and rushed him out the door. My father came home and we ate dinner and did what we normally did. Dad kept looking at Mom and could tell she was being weird, but didn't know what it was. Later that night, I could hear my father trying to get Mom in the mood, and Mom didn't want to. So my father became angry and asked her what the problem was. Mom screamed that she wanted a divorce, and then I hear a loud smack, and my father's truck starts and he drives away. I am standing by my bedroom door, and Mom reaches out to hug me with tears in her eyes. Fuck you, I hate you, I yell at my mom. Not even a day or two later, my mom's crackhead boyfriend moves in, and so do three or four other crackheads, and they're all gross, and like to grab my ass and try to get me to sit on their lap, and my mom just thinks they're being nice, and there is nothing pedophilic going on. One of the crackheads is talking about rather or not his niece has a better ass than mine, he is talking about bringing his niece to the house and having fun with her. I had no clue what he was talking about then, but now, as an adult, I do. My mom walks in my room, cigarette and scotch in one hand, in a bathroom, looking like the typical trailer park trash mom. And she says to me, you need to show my friend some respect, you little bitch, before I put a bell to your ass. Mom's boyfriend walks in and says, I can straighten that little bitch out. Mom then grabs his dick. I bet you could, she says, and then walks off. My mom sat there to let her boyfriend threaten to molest me, and she fucking joked about it. I called my father and told him to come pick me up. I left with my father, and then I called the cops and told them that my mom allowed her friends to touch me and threaten me, and that they were smoking crack and then they went to jail. A few years later, my mom's crackhead boyfriend comes back around to find me. Apparently now that I'm like 13 years old, I just learned that his name is Q-Tip and that that's his nickname or something. So Q-Tip finds out where I live and where I catch the bus and he starts calling the house and he is telling me that him and mom want me to come home and that I better come home or he is going to beat my ass. I tell Q-Tip to stop calling and he tells me that I'm an ungrateful little bitch and that my mother did everything for me. He threatens to kill my father and have mom take custody of me again. I then hang up. A few weeks go by and I wake up to see mom and Q-Tip in my father's front yard. They're staggering around and peeking in the windows and then they start calling out to me, telling me to get down here, and that they are taking me home. My mom looks like complete shit, and Q-Tip doesn't look strung out at all. I call the cops and tell them what is going on, and Q-Tip is taken back to jail, and mom is taken to a drug rehab clinic. I was still scared for days after that. I started carrying a knife to the bus stop with me, on the way to the bus stop one day, I see Q-Tip. He chases after me. He gets me on the ground, and I am squirming and trying to get away, and he is trying to take off my clothes. He gets up and pulls down his pants and whips it out. I then reach in my pocket, and I stab him in the stomach, and he lays on the ground. I then run away from him and he is finally taken to prison for attempted rape of a minor. And my mom is arrested for possession again. I don't know why mom threw away the life she had with my father and started smoking crack and allowed Q-Tip to try and rape me, but I will never forgive my mother for what she did 
Q-Tip was later murdered in prison, according to a cousin who writes my father. My cousin works as a prison guard at the prison, says that someone wasn't watching, and Q-Tip was surrounded and raped and stabbed to death by four other inmates. Their identity is still unknown. This happened when I was like seven years old. I was at the park with my mom and my cousins and we were playing on the jungle gym and having a great time. I see this guy standing off in the distance at the edge of the park. Mom always told me not to go to the edge of the park and to stay where she could see me. Me being a seven year old who loves dogs, I wanted to pet the man's dog. The man motions for me to come closer but I go back to where mom was and then we leave and go home. A week later, I see the man, but I don't see the dog. This time, a little girl comes up to me and asks if I want to pet the dog. The little girl is dirty and she is wearing torn clothes. She has scrapes and bruises on her legs and arms. I tell her no. She tries to grab my hand and drag me to the van. I scream and tell her to let me go. She runs back to the van and the guy grabs her by the hair and jerks her around and has his finger in her face and is cussing at her then throws her in the van and they drive off. When I was a kid, I did not understand what I was seeing. But now that I am much older, the thought of that little girl in that van and the guy with the dog scares me and also sickens me. The guy was a pedophile and the little girl was either his daughter or another girl he had kidnapped and he was using her to try to lure me to him. He probably was getting tired of the little girl and was going to kill her soon, but told her that if she lured me to him, that he would let her go. The dog I seen, I have no clue about the dog. I don't know if the guy was ever caught or if the girl ever got away or if he hurt anyone else. I moved from that town for unrelated reasons and no one else ever spoke of the guy and his dog. If you are new, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to my channel as it really helps me out. And if you are already subscribed, Welcome back and thank you for subscribing.